put them to that window miss, and I'm presenting this on behalf of my former mentor, Dr. Steve Foster from Harvard, and uh, who has taught me a lot of this aspect here. So, this is important here for this aspect. So, before, so let's get two questions here, okay? So, which of the following interleukin level is often elevated in the mucus of eye with intraocular lymphoma? Okay? Thanks. You have five choices, you have 20%. So it's a six, one beta, 10, 17, or eight. Okay, we can skip that. We wait, come back to the end for this thing. How about this one? The clinical manifestation of intraocular lymphoma can include, you can cell and clump or sheet of cells, multifocal yellow white lesion, the disc swelling, all of the above, or none of the above. Good. So if you ever in clinic with me, when I look at this, you always say, this is a sheet of cell. You heard me say that many times. So when you see a sheet of cell, it's most likely, in my experience, that this is likely to be a lymphoma case in this aspect. So this is definitely a all of the above in this act one here. The yellow white lesion at the RT level with this, the disc swelling is definitely possible as well, too. So this is the case that I came across also, too, um, while I was actually in fellowship here. So this is a 69 years old white female who developed a bilateral posterior virus in 1995. No previously known uh, flow there was a complaint. Uh, the anterior uveitis evolved, uh, triple topical steroid and injection. Then he was referred it, uh, to the retina service first, and then subsequently to the service. 2025 and 2070. Personal care to precipitate on the anterior segment, uh, blood, a little bit of cell in the anterior chamber there. So two, and then in the future, two plus cells in the right and three plus cells in the left. This is a photograph, okay. So these are actual group of whitish uh, cells that flowing around there. And uh, you also see this yellowish uh, coil retinal lesion uh, in the posterior segment there in the periphery. So prior investigation at one patient come to us, uh, the hematology, the hem panel was fine, chemistry, uh, syphilis, testing for cell coin, chest x-ray, urinalysis, skin test, uh, interleukin-2 receptor, uh, soluble one, we look for that. What did Dr. Kiran tell you? What did that will be, can be helpful for, potentially? Come on, show him that you actually listen to the talk and thing. Yes, thank you very much. You see, great. So yes, that was the thing that he, he mentioned before. So, so in case if you order something like that, 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 which is actually the sleep you can order, the soluble solution to receptor, that can be not 100%, but can help you a little bit in this aspect there. What diagnostic or therapeutic step would be in this patient's best interest at this time? So that's the, that's the picture you see. The patient already seen by retina. Now send it to us uh, in retina or you to see. If you have to see that patient at this stage, what would you like to do? Would you like to do more lab work? Would you like to watch? Would you like to do some surgical procedure to do something biopsy? with it? Biopsy. What type of biopsy? Vitreous biopsy. Vitreous biopsy. Anybody disagree with him? Anybody agree with him? Good. Okay. So some hand raising up. Okay. So this that. So new diagnostic rejectomy here. So now this is the word that we so we hate so much. We're so afraid of this thing. If you get a call from them and they said, you know, um, the pathologist just you notice just very few cells, but some of them are atypical looking. That's a bad thing. So we definitely don't want to hear that for our patient. And so this is suspicious for malignant cell here. So now this comes this question here. So this interleukin level uh, come back from this aspect and it's IL six is six and IL ten is forty eight. So one is much higher than the other. Anyone want to guess? When were IO6 elevated? When were IO10 elevated? Six for inflammation. Yes. 10 for lymphoma. Yes. So is that a correct answer? Or is it the other way around? Mm. Anybody want to support Dr. Park and say that's the correct answer? OK, we have two hands there. How about this side of the room? None of them is important, right? So IL-17, perhaps? No, so this is, that is the correct answer in there. So when you see IL-6, in most of the cases, that's the reason why you see study like WBIDIS where we use IL-6 inhibitor for a number of inflammatory cases because that is elevated in many cases of UBIDIS in this aspect. IL-10 has been shown to, um, uh, to be quite elevated in patients with intraocular lymphoma. Now, Dr. Park, for a bonus question, who were the people who showed this? This is a very landmark paper in there. 
Was it you? Starting no, <laughs> no, I did not ask that question, but it's really bad. So I did not ask it. I was actually still a fellow when this happened and thing there. So who came up with this? Which who published this? So this book came out from the National Eye Institute. There's a very famous uh, um, uh, pathologist there. She's now retired. His name, her name is Chi Chao Chen. So if you look at the Chen of that, that's the gentleman there. Actually, former Stanford, but now she's uh, retired already, resident there, but she's supposed to do that. So that's the famous work that show the the the, the important when you look at this ratio between IL six and IL ten in this aspect. And ten tend to be quite elevated in lymphoma, and six in upper inflammation aspect from there. So that's what he used, not a hundred percent by any means of strength of that, but that gives you a thought of this aspect from there. So this is the case in here. The other thing that coming out from actually a lot of the work was coming out from. Brigham, uh, Brigham and Young Hospital in, in Boston is the PCR for IgH gene rearrangement. So some of this work come out from Boston and did also positive for monoclonal cell population here. So that's quite important to show this aspect. So this patient has evidence that's very suggestive of interoperative B-cell lymphoma and still be a very high risk for developing CNS lymphoma. So by definition, at least in my career, whenever you have interoperative lymphoma, most likely, most likely, the patient who develop uh, the CNS lymphoma. The intra lymphoma may be the first manifestation, but when you see that, that's very significant because I have not seen yet in career the patient that just stay with the, end of the eye, so they mostly go to the brain, so we have to take action very aggressive for that as well. So the diagnosis here would be the intra large cell lymphoma that possibly would have the CNS involvement with this. So this patient was treated appropriately with intravenous methotrexate at Mass General Hospital with that, that, that time, so we followed that. So she received also radiation therapy uh, to the eye, and in 1996 at that time was thought to be reasonably cured. Visual acuity is 2030 and 2040. So how many of you have come across, have the opportunity to manage a patient with lymphoma and particular adrenal lymphoma? None. So this is, uh, uh, Dr. Kina has seen this before, I'm sure many of us in the faculty have seen this. This is a condition that's very concerning. The prognosis in general is not very great. The reason why is that it may be cured, but very likely it will be recurred to a different part. And it may be that the brain initially seems to be fine, no change in MRI, but you as the ophthalmologist will be seeing the patient and you will see the cell recurred and then shortly after that, then the the brain going back again. So this is a very alarming condition here. This is her and this aspect from there. So at this point, it considered to be stable. Like you remember the first picture you see with many of the lesion there, this seems to be stable and cute here. However, as the, uh, unfortunately, as kind of expected in 1997, she has relapsed in the eye, in the left eye, and in the brain. Uh, and my thing is usually we share a lot of these patients, so the, the patient will see us first or see the new oncology first, and they will always ask us if there evidence of recurrence in the eye. It would be great if we say yeah, no, and then if they have no, then we call you the following patient. If we say yes, then they say, okay, go ahead and treat it, and then they will also alter the management as well too, because they also know that when the eye recurs, the brain will like it to be recurs shortly after that as well. So remember, this is how clear she was. Um, and now see how when it's really recurs, you will see that again. So it's, it, this is very much a, a typical course of, of, of this patient in here with this aspect from there. And of course you will see this aspect and then you will see a lot of cells. So the, they, the patient with intraocular lymphoma can also present with hypopian as well. But the cell, if you think how many of you have seen hypopian? Okay, so hypopian in general, hopefully not from your cataract surgery, but from someone else's cataract surgery, for example. But when you see that, the cell in, in hypopian, let's say endophthalmitis, is a small, you don't see it uh, as so big and, and, and blumpy. The, the, the cell when you see recurrent in hypopian in lymphoma, those cells are big and juicy. I mean, it's completely different. It's still all white in there, but the cell much bigger. And if you do a tap, you send it in there, you will see like a typical cell in this aspect from there. So this is the type of that. And so she uh, regressed and the whole brain was irradiated, uh, this aspect from there. Unfortunately, uh, um, a few years later, the patient died of CNS lymphoma in this aspect. And so this is not a benign. This obviously, that's the reason why we have a special talk on this, just because it's very aggressive. And at times, uh, we as ophthalmologists will see the patient first, perhaps the ocular finding, and then try to, um, to, try to manage this aspect from there. So vitreous biopsy is very important in this aspect here. 
uh, we have discussed about this and we discussed, you know, when you do, like when Dr. Chu mentioned, you, when you do a counter type of biopsy for OCT, for example, you have to make sure that the lab that receives it is ready for this. So don't do this on a Friday afternoon, for example, because it will just sit there and you may not find anybody in pathology lab. So plan it in advance because it's very important that you get it there early in the day so that they can still process it. Because otherwise the cell sitting there will, will, will um, worsen. One of the well-known oncologists, uh, ophthalmic oncologist in the Bay Area, his name is Devin Shaw, who used to be a UCSF, but now in the, in the practice community, he has published on this topic and indicating that the, the, the chance that you get positive result is only about 50%. So when you in doubt, you do it again with that, but get more preparation out from that. Okay, so then the total vitrectomy, when you go inside the eye, don't just get a little bit because you don't know where the cell located. So just get as much as you can from there and then rapid delivery of specimen. So as a fellow, what I did was as soon as the thing out, you unscrub, you walk with the specimen uh, from at that time from Mass Annie over to Mass General and you deliver yourself. And you want to make sure that you don't lose that specimen because if you lose that specimen, your mentor will ask you to leave the fellowship also too. So, so that's very critical that you, you do that. That's, that's the problem. You want to get it to uh, the, the right place, uh, right fast enough so they can process it in there. The cytology is also very important here, this aspect from here. Uh, both the flow cytometry and the, um, the cytopathology is important. We talk about IL-6 and IL-10 level. IJG rearrangement is very important. Recently, the work on MYD ADA mutation uh, by the group at Proctor, as well as other Western, is also important. So now, when we remove, let's say when we remove specimen from, uh, from our patient here at Stanford here, when I check it off, I would check one of them would be to look for MYD ADA mutation and to help us. So we use various factors. None of these is 100% proof, so you cannot rely on IL level or you cannot rely on one, two, or the other. You just have to make sure that <coughs> you do multiple things throughout. And indeed, um, one of the patients that we have um, right now, the other one <coughs> was negative, but her MYD ADA is very positive uh, arrangement in there, and she's being managed right now by me and other, and her now she develops CNS lesion and that as well. The uh, intra lymphoma is a non Hodgkin large cell. The caveat for this is this. Yes, in the oral board question, uh, in other things, is the disease of elderly people. However, on your oral board, you should also indicate that it can occur also in a young patient. And we already uh, make the, uh, uh, not necessarily mistake, but one of the patients that we managed last year at Bayer start out with something that's quite atypical for lymphoma, uh, more like a more like infectious thing, but we work it out and the patient did not respond to any type of treatment. And then we did a biopsy, the first biopsy was non conclusive. The second biopsy, and the patient was only 38 years of age, has to have to be lymphoma. So in a rare group of patients, I do not want people to leave here and say this is occurring young people. It's a disease of elderly people, but in a subgroup of people, it can still be uh, a very uh, young group. So it cannot go out of completely. Uh, it's usually a bilateral disease uh, with this thing. When you see what's looking with me before the OCT of this, even though you may not see the clinical finding, you would see the OCT changes already in this patient bilaterally. And the delayed diagnosis is, is a trouble so we, we don't think of the we would miss it because of, uh, and then of course the high mortality rate is very important for us. The treatment for this would be combination chemotherapy plus intravitreal uh, rituximab and or methotrexate for this aspect from here. So we do that quite often. Um, if the eye relapsed first while waiting for that, then I perform an intravitreal injection. And I usually, for this, I combine both methotrexate and rituximab together uh, intravitreal. So, uh, John, you can go to retina. So what is the dose of my uh, methotrexate when we do intravitreal injection? 400, mil 400 micrograms. Okay. And Jose, what's the dose of rituximab? One milligram, 0 0.1 ml. Okay, so that's the combination that we order for this thing when we're really aggressive uh, with this. Okay, so so that's what we, we went there. And it, it does work. It helps to maintain. Certainly it doesn't cure, but it helps to control the disease until um, until the, the other system is part of well. But at times, if the brain has no recurrence, so then we, as the ophthalmologist, will treat the patient locally for that. And that's back from there. So the diagnosis is a cell in a glum of sh or sheet of cell. This is very clear that we see that quite often in this. And then we want to do the CT, the MRI, and this aspect, and then the diagnostic retractomy here. 
do it with dude like this or this aspect here. So Janice Davis from Boston Palmer like, discussed that when you do this thing like, like this, you want to uh, slow down your speed a little bit so that you're able to, to, to capture the cell and not have to cut it and destroy it. So at the time you slow down, you get it, and you, obviously you go where the seem to be most uh, uh, cellular part of your vitreous, and you get that, and then you send it away right away. And it's the pure, uh, it's the pure vitreous aspirate that you want. You also send the vitreous washing as well, but then you dilute the various uh, preservative in this aspect there. The undiluted vitreous you send for other things to rule out microbiology uh, kind of cases of the infection, but then you want to send the psychopathology, and you also obviously look at it six, uh, into look at six and ten. And then for the diluted vitreous, then you look at different aspects uh, from there. The cytology, you want, don't want to look at this. Uh, I, I am definitely a stay away from pathology because I'm very bad at it. But when you look at this, blue is bad. Those big thing in the middle, those are bad cells. So you don't want things that the send blue in this. So the, the cytology is obviously the gold standard for this. And you want to look at the various uh, specimen techniques for various things of that. And just make sure that I say, you, we at Upper Marches, are not necessarily expect to know the latest thing in this, but we should definitely communicate with the pathologists in advance so that they would do what the thing is for us to do in that thing. So this, see, this is a big blue uh, uh, cytoplasm. That is not very good, so this will be bad for those, those things in there. And so this is the, the famous work. And so Chi Chao Chan from there, Scott Whitcup, who used to be at the National Eye Institute, and then moved on forward to do some good work with Allegan. And one of the things Scott did was get the basis to be approved, uh, to be used for dry eye, and bring in a significant amount of funding for Allegan. But that's what went for. Chi Chao Chen was the one that lead in this aspect. This is some of the initial work that they do in there. And of course, uh, we have seen his name come across. So Robert Nelson Black was one of the leaders in this field. Um, Bob, unfortunately, passed away about five years ago unexpectedly. And so uh, these are some of the very well-known work. This is a very classic paper here. So for CNS endocrine lymphoma, this is early diagnosis and uh, very much brevet therapy here. High dose methotrexate uh, result much better outcome with this. So the diagnosis depend on the us as the ophthalmologist being suspicious of diagnosis, uh, early diagnostic retractomy. So when in doubt, do it. Uh, I think I mentioned one of you before. If you be this, if we suspect certain thing and we move forward and we say, okay, do we suspect this is the uh, inflammation? And as David was saying before, if you think this is OCP, it should respond to steroid treatment at least for a short course. If you think that this is diagnosis that you made, and then you treat with something and it doesn't respond, that should put a big flashlight. So my mentor used to say, do not just sit there. Then you need to get a specimen. That specimen may be the contatibrite, the vitreous, which is done at time when the eye is insalvageable, then I may end up doing a retina biopsy in that, and then only to try to save the fellow eye from remaining. So don't stop when you, you don't respond well, so you get the specimen with this aspect. And so if we have to manage patients with endocrine lymphoma properly, we may be able to save their life as well, too. Uh, so that's my talk here. Any question? You smiling. Question? Anything? You all set? So this is one thing that we should not miss, OK? So that's something that we should not miss, because if you miss this, uh, is, is, is first of all, definitely for the patient life, we not a good idea, but at the same time, it would be really hard to get. So when in doubt, when you elderly person or the young can be exposed to, they just to see some cell in it, and they, the patient being treated with, uh, let's say, prednisone, respond, but then they could, that would give you a headache with that. Okay, now, I actually have several cases. Do you want to finish now, or do you want to at least go over one of the cases? I'm going either way. Anybody who's tired want to leave? Come just, on. If you we really just do need to be conscious. I think someone might have this room scheduled at 6 o'clock. Okay. They're so on there, but they haven't showed up yet. So okay. Up. So we have 10 minutes. You want to do one case or you want to leave or go? What do you think? I'm sorry? Go? You should go. <laughs> okay, you're tired. Okay, that's fine too. That's good. That's good. That's good. Everyone is tired. So yeah, let's, let's finish then. So, um, so we don't do the cases, right? Let's do the cases. Oh, do the cases. Okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you speak louder. So I go, okay, so this is the case here. Okay, so I'm going to take a, um, this is a real case that actually. Uh, uh, no, sorry, I cannot do that because, um, okay, so let me. 
I learned a lot in this case. Okay, so this is a difficult case, uh, at least for me it was. So she's a 64 years old woman um, from uh, Maryland, when I was there, there. She has four days of painted loss of vision in the right eye, okay? So uh, she, uh, she, was, uh, she, she was a realtor, and for whatever reason, Maryland did not do so well. She, she can be depressed, and she on several of the antidepressant medication. She has high cholesterol level. And she has uh, bladder surgery, but is that dose of the medication so far that she's on? She has a history of cold sore about once a year and no history of genital ulcer, okay? Uh, no sore, still white patches on the skin and forearm and easy bruising, a sign of struggle showing her breath. So she, I mentioned, she worked at a real estate agent and she recently has been showing old home with moldy environment. So I thought that was very relevant. She also smoked one pack of cigarettes per day she spent time living in Iran, Turkey, and Switzerland, and she had two dogs and a cat several years ago. So these are all things that I thought was kind of relevant to the case I, I, I uh, reviewed on thin there. So visual acuity is count finger at one and a half feet, and uh, um, the left eye is 2032, pin over to 2025, so mainly a united process. Still in the examination showed that the eyes inflamed, and this aspect when there's significant inflammation in the front of the eye, three plus cell uh, in the right, uh, no cell in the left, and then pressure so far so good for serious and naked eye in the right eye. This is the right eye. That's the fundus, and it's not that the, that the camera is out of focus. This is a real view here. So, what do you think? So, first of all, what do you see? Uh, well, more than just vitritis, right? So vitritis itself, you see now, you actually see clumping, little white ball moving around. So if I describe as something white, white moving around like this, what should be in the top differential diagnosis here? If you see a patient on call, the patient come in, that the view is quite hazy, and you see this whitish little ball moving around the eye, what should be the first thing on your mind? Candida. I'm sorry? Candida. Yes, so it could should be a fungal infection, right? So it's known to be that that would be used there. So infectious etiology should be that maybe Candida, maybe not, but you should think of a, a fungal cases in that aspect from there. And and so the patient has a history of a of a working in an environment where there are more than things, so could this be a case of a more the eye aspect, okay? So that's the case there. This is more picture of that aspect from there. So quite easy. That's why her vision is hand motion. And this is the left eye, uh, somewhat a little bit clearer there, uh, did not have any of those things aspect from there. But it does show that some of the vessel or sclerotic tears, so there's at least bilateral involvement, and that uh, the other eyes, even though we have some little bit of hemorrhage that you see there, have also the very sclerotic vessel there, okay? And this is the floor scene, in this aspect, the nerve is, uh, is um, somewhat lighting up as well, so the optic nerve is a little bit involved here as well. Okay, so this is clinical di uh, the presentation, so diagnosis. And of the mind is from Fungal. endogenous, should we say, yeah, right? Because she's not had any surgical procedure, she doesn't have anything like that. She would have, this would be endogenous. So one eye, okay, it's actually bilateral environment. You call it endo, uh, end of the mind is, so perhaps with that aspect from there, uh, not so much inflammation in the left eye, but certainly in the right eye, not from there. So, so we think of that, that aspect. So what is the most important lab that you want to get here? And would you start any therapeutic intervention, or would you manage the patients as an inpatient or outpatient? So before you call your third year, or as you advise your event to the, your first year, what would you do here? Blood culture. I'm sorry? Blood okay, culture. blood culture. So the patient does not have any uh, uh, fever or anything, so but that's <coughs> fine. So you want to do blood culture. What else? Echo. Echo from four? Heart to see. Heart. So you think this is a endocarditis leading to that aspect? You have to look for the source. So. Okay, so, so, okay, what else? Okay, so management here. So now, what do you want to do? We just bounce out. While waiting for this thing, because it takes a while to get those cardiologists come in to do echo for you, right? And the patient is sitting there right now, so you have to think of something real that you need to do. 
tap and tap and inject. So tap and inject. Okay. So you would remove some fluid from the eye, and you would do in this aspect from there because you're thinking this is uh, uh, an infection. So what would you inject? Voriconazole. I'm sorry. If you think about fungal infection, we can inject voriconazole. Okay. So you inject uh, uh, an antifungal like voriconazole. Okay. That's potentially uh, uh, important in this aspect from there. We usually tend to go with aflatoxin, but that's fine. What else? So you can cover mm -hmm. the uh, bacterial infections like vanco and cephalidin. Okay, so you cover the broad spec to cover this aspect from there. So this is what we did. We tapped it there with intravitreal injection. We also, in addition to the what you do, we also think you can cover it for the viral as well too. So we cover first time. Why did I say viral? The first picture on the right eye certainly was not a case in general. We don't think of viral because it was born there. But the left eye with the little bit of the hemorrhage, the retina, is that that's what we're more concerned of, right? So that's what we do in this aspect here. And we also saw an idea of here because of the, a lot of the hepatic thing we do. And then we also uh, involved the antifungal in this aspect and all over cinosol as well, too. So now, as you send a patient to work up, this has become more of a thing in here. So now her chest x-ray, she has pulmonary abnormality. Uh, she has interstitial pattern of airway thickening. She has also widening of the melastinum as well, too. And um, with this aspect, <coughs> so now what do you want to do? So this is a real case in this aspect from there that I struggle for a while to manage this patient in here. We can get biopsy from that. Uh, Lesions on the mediastinum. So you want to do a lung biopsy. So this is a very aggressive uh, uh, ophthalmologist, which is fine. Which is, we can be like that. We can really convince them to be aggressive to do like that. So you need to be, you know, how our team does stuff. And that's what we say. Those uh, consultant outside, they're not, they're not supported. So you have to be very assertive here, and we want to do a biopsy. So indeed, um, indeed, in this case here, we uh, proceed before we go into the the the, the, the design more. We get a chest CT with this which show multiple lung nodules at the left lower lobe. Remember, the patient also was a smoker too for a long time as well too. So she also had the right hyaluronic limb dog as well. So as, as we recommended in there, with this aspect in there, we proceed and we do a biopsy. So what do we now, this is where the, 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 the value come from. So what do we expect to see in the biopsy? This side has been very quiet here, yes. What do you think sarcoid? Okay, so why do you think this case is sarcoid? Because I've watched where uh, she has both the uh, pulmonary and the ocular. Ocular. Yeah. So ocular finding and as well as the pulmonary finding in this case. So 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 um, Khalid's first uh, uh, impression is sarcoid. Anybody agree, disagree? I think this is uh, primary it's a cancer in line with metastasis to the eye. Okay, that's number two. Anybody with the infection anymore? We talk about a lot about infection now, so what happened to all the infection? I'm sorry? Okay, it could still be fungal in this aspect here. So this was the biopsy show. So the biopsy showed the right node that should react with lymphocyte. So far, so good. We didn't see anything specifically. But then from the vitreous sample that we end up moving in this aspect from there, what we so I ended up doing an, actually a vicious biopsy in this patient as well too. Not just a tap, but actually did a, a whole rejection in here. So this is now covered with multinuclear macrophage with carrying the diagnosis of sarcoid, right? So yeah, so this is the case of that aspect too. So she then had progressive difficulty breathing a steroid was taken in this aspect from here. And the lung biopsy show of this aspect and show the, the multinuclear giant cell. So first we get the um, Vitreous biopsy from this aspect, but to really confirm, so we did convince the, the lung group team to do a biopsy on her as well too. So that come out to be a multinuclear giant cell as well from this. So at this moment, uh, with this aspect from there, we think the diagnosis now is what? Sarcoid. So we were going with the sarcoid because of this uh, of this um, biopsy result in here. So of course, of course we'll do that, then we go right away. If we see the sarcoid, uh, we have lung there, so we go right away for the uh, what's the first line therapy for sarcoid? Steroid. So actually, the first line of therapy, when you first have active sarcoid, primary thing, you go with, with the hydrosteroid. So that's what the patient was treated for. So this is an aspect from here. She has some lesion, and this is what you're supposed to just show you. So this is the type of lesion that you can see in patient with sarcoid in this as, uh, various aspects. Like this 
this is not her, but this is the lesion that, that the erythema nodosum that we expect to, uh, to see in Togo as well. So uh, she was start treatment. So after about uh, seven months, her vision uh, now was just about 2063. A lot of this has to do with the cataract that she has. And then she was maintained in um, this aspect with the microfiber implant zone for this aspect here. So this was a real case that I managed while I was in Baltimore, and it's a very uh, um, uh, humbling case for me because I definitely, uh, when we first presented it, we go step by step, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, you go with the most uh, uh, likelihood that if you miss, what will go on the worst. So we really worry about infection initially. So we don't want to miss infection. If it's an inflammatory condition, if you miss, you, you can have some time to recover. But if you miss an infection cause, then you definitely uh, would not be able to recover well. So that's why we treat that. And then as we learn some more, we proceed with this aspect. So that's what she looked like. Uh, remember all the vicious ball before? Now it's all cleared up in this aspect from there. And so um, so the clinical pool in this case, as um, Dr. Khalid from Iraq I just mentioned here, so the optimization of SOCO is very protein. It may be the initial uh, presentation of an underlying systemic disease. What's the like? What is the percentage of um, cases in which the eye is the first manifestation of sarcoid? So it's about three to five percent. That's a study come out from Boston. So about three percent of the time, you will see that the eye will present at the first ocular manifestation of sarcoid in this aspect from there. If the disease not responding properly to treatment, additional dilution is done. So clearly, we, we, she did not respond to antibiotics very well in this case, despite what we do individual as well as systemic. So that's why we move forward with this aspect. And certainly, we can play a really important role in here uh, from that. And I think that's the end of that aspect here. This is good case. So uh, that, I thought, was a very uh, learning case for me. I uh, mean, you guys learn a lot from that as we move to the process of that. And, the answer is not always there, and it was not there for me initially, uh, but I would work through the process to get more data that would turn out to be more. But uh, the, the sarcoid uh, manifestations can be quite protein in multiple ways. Okay, with that, I think that we can leave so that we finish before six o'clock, and uh, I don't want to have any that. Okay, thank you. Any questions for anyone?